What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another episode here at the stable. Or maybe we can't call it the stable anymore because of the boat sitting behind us. And not one person guessed the name of this car correctly. No, this is not an Austin Healey. No, it's not a Kaiser Darren either. This is a 1954 Glass Par G2, which some would argue that it is the first kit car. Kit car because back in the day you could buy these as a body with the blueprints and plans for a frame. When you talk about rare cars, this this is pretty rare rare because it is estimated that there are only about 29 of these in the world and i joked about it being a boat because it is an all fiberglass body and the company glass part originally made boats before they made this car so i know some of you are thinking oh no that means the scrap thing is going to be put on the back burner well no it's quite the opposite actually building this glass part is going to help us fund the scrap stain. And that brings me to my next point. What are the plans for this glass bar? Well, this car being built 50 years ago means that there's gonna be a lot of wear and tear. So I figured why not do the inspection with you guys so we can learn about the condition of this car together. Starting off with the paint job. It's obviously white, yes, but taking a closer look, we can see some cracks, chips, as well as some paint runs. Which considering its age, it's not that bad. Hopping in through the interior is fun with uh, these little doors. This is, this is the fun part right here. You have to get in in a specific angle, stab your hip into the panel here and rub your butt against the steering wheel. And after a bit of yoga, you're in. Once you're inside, the first things you will notice is this giant steering wheel, which if you're driving around on a Sunday cruise, enjoying your day, you come up to a sharp corner and bam, you just lost your fingers. That explains why there is a tear exactly in this spot because of all the fingers it has claimed throughout history. Also, I forgot to mention that this car was originally built by a test pilot, which will explain how this car was built. And the original builder's name was John Nebel. Taking a look inside our cockpit here, you will be greeted by a couple gauges, a couple standard ones, water temp, oil pressure, water temp, water temp again and this is the interesting one manifold pressure and for those of you unfamiliar with manifold pressure manifold pressure is usually used in fuel injected engines this one's carbureted by the way we'll get to the engine in a sec again usually used in fuel injected engines but it's not usually a gauge that we see it's a it's a tool that the ecu will use to determine um, what the engine is doing so most of us wouldn't even know how to understand or read what that pressure gauge is saying. But with the builder being considered an expert test pilot, it is no surprise that he has that. Because without a doubt, that man understood his machine better than any of us could. Moving along, we have our speedometer as well as our tachometer. Down the list, we have oil pressure as well as fuel pressure and uh, fuel pressure again. I know a lot of these have been repetitive. There's two water temperature sensors as well as two fuel pressure sensors, but I believe some of those are going to the transmission. So we're either getting transmission fluid temp or transmission fluid uh, pressure. Oh, you thought that was it for the gauges? No, taking a look down here, under the passenger footwell, we have two more temperature gauges as well as a current indicator and a voltmeter. And for those of you keeping track, that is 14 gauges in this car. 15 if you count this one up here. And that's why it's important to know that a test pilot built this car. Maybe he just wanted to feel like he was flying with all those gauges. Taking a look at the upholstery, it is now clearly showing its age. Alrighty, so, so far, what is on our to-do list? We have paint and body, obviously some upholstery work, and we are going to redo the dash and probably eliminate some of these gauges. Because unless the future owner of this car is a skilled test pilot like our friend John, I doubt they would need him. Alrighty, so we have paint, body, some upholstery, and some interior work, and I haven't even shown you guys my favorite part of the car. Alrighty, let's take a look under the hood. Taking a look under the hood is where it gets pretty interesting because I promise you, you have not seen anything like this. To start off, we have a 231 cubic inch V6 attached to a TH350 automatic transmission. That's not the interesting part though. The interesting part is everything else. Let's talk about the cooling system. The cooling system consists of one radiator, 
and one AC condenser. AC condenser, what are you talking about? Yes, this AC condenser in here holds coolant, which therefore travels to our second radiator. Attached to the front of our secondary radiator, we have an electric cooling fan, and behind our secondary radiator, we have a shrouded mechanical fan. This is the shroud for our mechanical fan, and what is it? It is a inner tube from a tire. I do wanna make something clear though. In no way, shape, or form are we bashing on how this car was built, because I'm sure as hell that the expert test pilot that built this car knew what he was doing. Is it questionable by today's standards? Probably. This car is the embodiment of the statement, just get it done. And does that remind you guys of any other project? John built this car for himself. He built it to his standards, to how he liked it. Whether that means redundancy with a dual radiator setup and dual fan setup, to having gauges that most people would not understand. Just how we relocated our engine as well as our wiring, we are building this car to my liking, to my taste. I'm surprised John didn't put two alternators in here just for the redundancy like airplanes have. Anyway, back to the engine bay. There is also some pressure sensors here that I believe are reading the coolant pressure. Once again, something only John would have understood. And for those of you wondering, we haven't gotten to that part of the video yet, but it does run and drive. So what are the plans for the engine? We will be swapping this engine and transmission combo out with something a little bit more powerful. I'm not gonna give away too much details yet, but the engine swap will consist of a lot of fabrication work, um, as well as designing how everything is going to go. All right. With that out of the way, actually, let's take a look at something else. I am noticing that the headers are different on either side. I know it's a bit difficult to see, but this looks like a stock um, cast iron header for this engine. I can definitely tell that this other side was a DIY job based on the welds and the types of cuts that were made here. You can see that the primary tubes were cut and welded together. My assumption is that they did this in order to clear that steering box that is right under there. Whereas this other side does not have any obstructions for them to have done uh, any modifications to the manifold on this side. And that's just another example of that make it happen mentality. All right, let's move on to the underside. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the underside of the car, which holds one of my favorite details about this car. So on the underside of this car, we have a beer keg, not just any keg, it's a Miller Brewing Company keg. And some of you probably got it already, but yes, that beer keg is our fuel cell. I find that hilarious and also badass. Taking a look at the underside, things get just as interesting as the engine bay. Right here, we have our electric fuel pump with an inline fuel filter. If we follow that line, another fuel filter, and if we follow that line, we'll hit another fuel filter. So by the time the fuel hits the carburetor, it should be extra filtered. But here's where it starts getting crazy. For those of you that are scared of wiring, uh, you might want to close your eyes. We have a jungle of wiring down here that I would consider a borderline fire hazard. A lot of this stuff is not even connected to anything, so it's just it looks like just a bunch of trial and error and um, trying to make something work. But again, this car runs and drives with no issues. All the lights and all of the electronics work. Um, so it might be messy, but, but it works. And amongst this jungle of wire, you will notice this, a trailer connection. This car does feature a tow hitch. So if you were to tow something with this car, you could hook up your trailer lights to it and have it fully functional. It also holds one of those connectors up front. So you can also tow the car. Which leads us to another fun bit of information. This car has two tow balls up front. What for, you may ask? Oh, nothing crazy, just a custom tow hitch. <laughs> that is just so cool. What vintage race car do you know that can not only tow something, but also be flat towed? This car is just filled with personality and a rich history. Speaking of personality, this car has another feature that I bet you haven't seen before. See, this passenger seat is not just a regular passenger seat. It was modified in order for John's wife to be able to lay down and have a snooze while they're on a road trip. How cool is that? So taking a look inside of here, you can see the custom footwell that was made in order to be able to lay down in here. I mean, I see this as a very functional modification. Say you're on a solo road trip and you have to stop because you're too tired. You just pop in here, take 
a couple hours snooze. Wake up and you're good to go. That's that's pretty damn cool. Also, there's a bunch of pins around the cabin area here. And what these are for is uh, to have a cover for rain or weather, whatever you want while this thing is parked. But how cool would it be to pop that cover on while you're in there taking a nap? Once again, the builder made that modification specifically for his wife. So that just goes to show ladies that if he wanted to, he could. All right, so where does that leave us on our to-do list? In addition to what we have already mentioned, we have to do a engine and transmission swap. We have to do a complete rewire from tail light to headlight. And in regards to the tail lights, we have six of them currently. So we are probably going to delete these big ones as well as these ones on the bumpers. So we definitely have our work cut out for us. Well, that is pretty much. Wait, didn't you say it ran in drive? Let's drive it. Right. Let's do that. Yeah, she runs and drives. She runs and drives pretty damn nice, actually. <laughs> the door opened. No big deal. We're going not very fast something went in my eye this 231 v6 um, is obviously not going to be winning any races anytime soon but it's a nice cruiser i guess it doesn't matter if it runs and drives pretty well because we're going to be removing the powertrain and the drivetrain as well but you guys get the idea well as you guys saw she does run and drive i didn't want to take her too far because uh well it's not my car and once again guys this was not to bash on the way that this car was built or the condition of the car these kind of inspections are crucial when starting any project that way we can get an accurate idea of what kind of work is ahead of us but if you guys would like to see more of the glass part as well as all the work that is going to take place let me know down in the comments we will get back to the scraps thing in the next video also don't forget we have a giveaway coming up for reaching 10,000 subscribers so make sure you're notified and subscribed with that being said thank you guys for watching and i will see you on the next one